comedy isn't subjective? That can't be true. You may not like this joke, like this joke, definitely not like this joke. And it feels like joke preference changes from person to person. But what if I told you that scientists have found a joke that is rated as the funniest? But before I get to the funniest joke in the world, I'm going to explain to you what makes something funny, why comedians keep getting canceled, show you a video of the first time I ever attempted stand up, and end with what surveys say is the funniest joke in the world. In order to understand how scientists study jokes, you must first understand what makes something funny. It is found that on average, people laugh 17.5 times per day. I don't know what a 0.5 laugh is, like a ha ha. And a good sense of humor tends to always be one of the highest rated traits for friends, for spouses, and even lovers. Why are we so attracted to funny? It is predicted that human language evolved between 80,000 to 160,000 years ago, pushed by the evolutionary advantage of storytelling. Evolutionary biologists think it is because as a pack, it would have been helpful to tell stories about that other pack, to, you know, talk about the dude over there who's kind of like killing everyone, or to maybe be like, wait, where are the berries at? Where are the berries at? In fact, a lot of theorists think that at first, our language evolved as gossip, a way to sort of parse out and like talk smack about the people around you in order to keep yourself safe by understanding who was dangerous and who was on your side. Humor and laughing, on the other hand, evolved as a signal to yourself and to others that things were safe, that things were okay. As hunter-gatherers, when we were laughing and when we were telling jokes, it meant that it was time to play, to socialize, and explore. That's why we still enjoy jokes now and comedians now and humorous things, because it's actually a sign that we are, in fact, safe. Which is really fascinating, because in order to understand the best joke in the world, you have to understand what it means to feel safe and unsafe at the same time. Known as the benign violation theory, a joke requires three things. One, an unsafe violation of a situation. Two, a flip of that situation so it feels safe. And three, both perceptions must occur simultaneously. Okay, this can sound confusing, but there is a clear metaphor to understand and remember this theory. If a friend tickles you, they are in fact violating you but it feels safe because you know them well, you can laugh, you can have a little giggle, you can say, stop, get off. But if a stranger on the bus tickles you, yes, they are violating you, but there's no flip of that situation that feels safe. You feel unsafe, you push them away, you get upset, you don't laugh, maybe you pop their eyeballs out with your thumbs. It's a completely different situation. A good joke has to feel safe and unsafe at the same time. In fact, scientists took people and put them in an fMRI machine and made them watch The Simpsons and Seinfeld and found that joke detection occurred in the left inferior frontal and posterior temporal cortices of the left side of the brain. That was a lot of big words, but this is the part of the brain that tries to make sense of contrasts and look for resolutions in our lives. Comedians have a brilliant way of talking about things that feel taboo, maybe we don't wanna say them out loud, the darkest thoughts that we might have, and flipping them to feel resolved and safe so that we can laugh. And it is also why there can be such stark contrasts between what you think is funny and what someone else does. A lot of straight white male comedians Comedians are coming under fire recently for saying jokes that they think are safe, but audiences are telling them now are offensive. This is really fascinating because a lot of these jokes are at the expense of women or queer people or people of color. And historically, comedians have mostly been white and male. In the 1970s, only 2% of professional stand-up comedians were women. In the 1990s, 20% of professional stand-up comedians were women. And now it's only 35% of professional stand-up comedians that are women. But it does mean that new voices have a emerged in the comedy sphere and comedy has essentially evolved because audiences are going to feel more safe seeing a woman make fun of a woman or a queer person making fun of the queer experience. And by proxy, these people are going to be better at telling these jokes, at making their audiences feel safe while talking about the taboo things that come along with being a queer person, for example. This now leaves the white men to have to think of new ways to make the benign violation theory work for them. I'm about to show you uh, the video of the first time I ever did stand-up comedy. It is about two years ago to this day almost. I feel like I'm gonna barf. It's one of the cringiest things I've honestly ever seen. I've actually only been able to watch it once in my life just to like try and learn from it and then I just couldn't again. I cannot believe I'm gonna show this to in this video, I say a lot of ums, which is like the number one rule. It's like, don't say um. I'm obviously just procrastinating. This is a sad attempt at me trying to use the benign violation theory. Here you go. I uh, actually was a closeted high school kid who had to try and date guys while sharing a landline with my parents. And so 
I used to go to this thing called the Homo Hop, which was like a gay party, and I'd like dance and make out with guys. And sometimes they'd want to get in contact. And nothing screams, screams being mature enough to date someone than writing, like, my parents don't know the truth about me underneath my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this isn't usually how dating works, but it was, like, really scary when they'd actually want to call. Um, every time the phone rang in my house at that time, it kind of felt like when Princess Diana died. It was like, I was scared and nervous and sad, but I didn't know if I needed to be. <laughs> Okay, that was awful. That was the first time I think I'd ever really been on stage. Princess Diana dying <laughs> is an unsafe situation. And I think I was trying to relate it to like my own queerness, my own vulnerability. As a young person at the time, I didn't understand why we were all so sad. I just like cried with my parents because it felt like the right thing to do. And also, in fact, scientists have found that there's a 17 day latency period between a national tragedy happening and you being able to make a good joke about it. This joke that I made was like 21 years after this tragedy, so I hope it was okay, but again, it was the first time I ever did comedy. It was essentially what I would say a bad joke, so maybe it didn't work. But how scientists figured out this latency period is exactly how they figured out what the funniest joke in the world is statistically. Known as Laugh Labs, a website was left up for a year where 1.5 million participants took part in a survey studying humor. Participants around the world would give their information over, do a survey, get fed a bunch of jokes and interesting questions about humor, sliding scale answers of how funny or unfunny they thought things were. And with all of this data, there were some pretty fascinating things that we were able to take away. The most effective jokes are 103 letters long. So all you Twitter heads out there, write that down. People seem to enjoy jokes the most at 6.03 PM. Maybe tired from the day, a little delusional, laugh, laugh, laugh. The funniest animals were ducks which I think makes sense. They've got corkscrew dicks. And most fascinatingly, the joke I am about to tell you came in as the funniest joke in the world. It follows the benign violation theory quite clearly, so you might think it's really funny, or maybe your comedy sense is a bit more alt. I'm gonna read this to you like a librarian. Two hunters from New Jersey are out in the woods when one of them collapses. He doesn't seem to be breathing and his eyes are glazed over. The other guy whips out his phone and calls emergency service. He gasps, I think my friend is dead, what should I do? The operator says, calm down, I can help. First, make sure he's dead. There is a silence, then a shot is heard. Back on the phone, the guy says, okay, now what? I must say a bit too violent for my sensitive tastes. I find the neurophysiology and evolution of humor to be extremely fascinating, especially as someone trying to like attempt stand-up comedy. But the writer E.B. White did famously say that analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. Very few people are interested and then the frog dies. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now you, in the link below, you need to click that link because the first thousand people that do get a free Skillshare premium membership. They go fast, so make sure you click it quickly. I'm a person who loves and needs new experiences. So Skillshare for me was very important this year. I took a sci-fi creative writing course. I learned from Matt Belisai how to write creatively to make viral things work on the internet, which was really interesting. And I used those skills to make a bunch of viral TikToks, which ended up working out for us. And now we have like a pretty good TikTok. Also, I became a birder this year, obsessed with birding now. And so I took a nature photography course, which helps me take better photos of the birds. It's wild because I learned all these things just through Skillshare. Honestly, it is, I, it's just an amazing resource. To be honest, Skillshare has gotten me through this pandemic. It's an online learning community where there's thousands of classes that you can take if you're a creative, curious person. They teach you to explore new skills, deepen passions you already have, and make life feel a little bit more fulfilling while stuck at home. There's no ads, it's only $10 a month, but again, if you click the link in the description, the first thousand people will get a Skillshare premium membership for free. I also think it's an amazing gift idea for the holidays. It's something that keeps on giving, you're giving someone an experience, which is always a really great idea. So use the link in the description as well for someone else. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribed and we'll see you next week for a new science video.